Welcome, welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu, La'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Amen. And uh, <laughs> I was just thinking, this this is really challenging stuff, uh, this particular parsha, and try, I'm so not good at visualizing things based on, on the verbal descriptions. Some people are just gifted with that, I know. Um, and so it's it's really interesting. So to whatever extent, it, what I'm thinking is, to the, whatever extent Jews are in the rag trade, my gosh, this is, you know, here it is in the Torah. My, my dad was in the rag trade. Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, uh, let's go to the, let's go to a share. And we'll pick up with the text. All right. So apparently we were just uh, finishing up, finishing up just the last little Rashi here on verse 24. So this is Mimu Panav. Uh, so the, it was a little difficult to even without my typing stuff in this Hebrew here. So I realized it was Mimu Panav means opposite its face or his face. But ever hachitzon, which means on the outside, and uh, we were talking. Let's take a look quickly at the pictures. Let's see if we can see anything there that makes sense. So I'm going to we let's look at this. So I believe we were talking about about these threads. Okay, so there, this would be, of course, on the inside, right? This this flap gets folded back and makes a pocket of the breastplate. So this for sure would be, these rings would be on the inside. So this was a little confusing. Uh, oh, that's nice. Um, let's see here, this is a nice, isn't that pixelated either, which is pretty amazing, right? This was described earlier on, yeah. So this is, uh, these are on the outside. These rings here are on at the edge on the outside. So, okay, well, just whatever it was, we need, we need to go back. Let's go back to a different share. We'll go back to the text and go to the next verse. So, and uh, I just want to check to see if you're muted. I think someone is unmuted there. All right, so here we go. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, Right. Okay. I'm going to do another. I'm going to do another share here. Uh, <laughs> Golda, funny. Golda chatted and said, "Too bad they didn't have Velcro." Ha ha ha. Okay. Give me a second. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to go to this particular picture. Give me one second. And this way we can look and see. Let's take a look at this. And so this is where these rings were, and these blue ribbons that went around and then tied in the front here and um, that they sit right on, you know, right above the cheshev. Remember the cheshev is this belt on the A-foot and I'll give you another picture to show you that. Let's see, can you, I'm assuming you can see that. Okay. Oh, sorry, one second. Forgive me. Okay. So this, I'm assuming that there must might have been rings there too, unless it was actually attached. But this is the Cheshev right there. You can see. All right. Let's go back into this again. I'm just so grateful to have these books, this book that had these illustrations. Okay. So, by year Chesu, okay, yeah. Right, Mimala Cheshev Haifot. That's the last little part there. So above the cheshev of the ephod, right? Vayir chasu et hachoshen mitaabotav, and they shall fasten. This is not a common word here, but it, it's Rashi will give you some other examples. But it means to fasten, to 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 connect it, right? To connect to the choshen, the breastplate, mitaabotav from its rings or. Um, el tabot ha'efod to the rings 
of the afood. So I would have to think that even though we couldn't see those rings where the ribbon came out, there were ribbons there. Biftil trelet, there we go, with a trelet, either a purple or a blue ribbon. Riyot al cheshev al fod, to be on the the, the belt part, the cheshev, we'll just call it the cheshev of the ephod. The lo yizach choshen, so that the, the breastplate does not move. Again, this is a little bit of a, an unusual word here. But basically, if you this much I can visualize is that it's preventing the breastplate from moving back and forth, may al ha'efod, um, so that it will not move from above the ephod itself. And we'll take a look at the Rashi. Okay. So, did we do this? Do you remember? Maybe we did. Maybe we did. We did Kaf Zion. So, yeah, but that's Kaf Chet. Sorry, we did do Kaf Zion. All right, here we are. Kaf Chet. Here we are. Vayir Chasu. There we are. Uh, Lashon Chibur. It has the meaning of connection, attachment, attachment. Uh, the word for friend in Hebrew is Chaver. Definitely, right? Completely associated with this root to uh, be attached. So a chaver, a friend, is someone one is attached to, certainly emotionally. V'chein, and he gives other examples because, as I said, this vayir chasu is an unusual word. But he gives an example from Tehilim, from Psalm 31. Meruchse ish. Okay? So that's the, that's the again, an unusual language here, difficult language. And he says... A chabure chevle rishaim, right? Uh, in other words, an association um, with with uh, bands of the wicked, right? So meruchse ish, referring in that verse, referring to preventing a person from associating with uh, bands of wicked people. V'chein, and likewise, Isaiah 44, uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, passage there. V'harechasim levik'ah. And there's that word, rechasim. You say, yechasu, that, you can see that root there. And here it's referring to, so it's saying, and the mountain chains into a plain. I believe it's that beautiful passage um, that opens up and talks about how God's presence, he's, Isaiah is so inspired with the idea of God you know, being present amongst human beings and that people sense the divine presence. So he says, he explains, Harim, so the rechasim refer to mountains that are connected one to the other. In other words, a mountain chain, right? Where it becomes impossible to go down into the valley between them, between these chains of mountains. Only with great difficulty because on account of their being connected one to another, Hagai Zakufa, the valley is goes straight down. It goes straight up and down for Amuka, and it's also deep. You Levikat Mishor, and they those will become a level plain Lelech, and easy to go to. And the idea is that these days, uh, Isaiah is comparing, well, in Isaiah's time, I believe, he was speaking to the Jewish people who were then, had experienced exile, the Babylonian exile. And he was predicting the fact that that exile was going to come to an end and that the presence of God was going to break forth into human behavior and, and human life and people would be able to experience the divine. And so he's talking about barriers, barriers to experiencing the divine, that those barriers would break down and people would be able to experience the divine presence. 
And uh, of course, Isaiah is such an incredibly gifted poet, and he uses metaphors that are just so powerful and just moving. Uh, if you read Isaiah, if you want to read Isaiah 43, uh, 44, excuse me, chapter 44. Liot al Cheshev Haifod, so as to be over or on the Cheshev, that belt of the Aifod. And again, he explains. Liot Hachoshin Davuk el Cheshev Haifod. So, what it means, it is, Arashi is just giving us a little more precise sense of what's going on here. And that is so that it is stuck literally to the, the Cheshev, this belt of the Aifod. The Lo Yizach. Right, and again, he takes. He knows this word is not an easy word. Rashi knows this, right? So he says, "Lashon nituk," that when this word "izach" has the meaning of breaking away, the lashon aravihi, and it actually is an Arabic word, a word from Arabic, kedivre. And here he refer, refers. He makes these references, "Dunash ben Lavrat." So one of his teachers possibly, was this person by the name of Dunash ben Lavrat. And I believe we have some Azmirot uh, and, and Yutim that are attributed to this particular person. <clears throat> Excuse me. So going on. The Nasa Aharon. Sure, I've got the right place here. The Nasa Aharon Etchmot Bnei Yisrael, the Choshen Hamishpat, and Aaron shall carry the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment, Alibo on his heart, right? Because that's where the breastplate was. Bevo El Hakodesh, when he comes into the holy place, the sanctuary, Lezichron as a remembrance. Ifnei Hashem Tamid, before the Lord always. Now, um, this is a very powerful sentence here uh, that lends itself to some contemplation here as to the significance of what the, what the Torah is saying here. So one is the idea of Choshen Mishpat. And before I get into the Rashi, right? The breastplate of judgment and the idea of Mishpat has to do with justice and careful, and, and, the, and that justice is so important. And um, when we talk about Eloheinu, when we refer to God as Eloheinu, uh, the traditional understanding of that is that we're willing to accept God as our judge. And you may have heard me share that with you before. So this idea of justice and 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 how important there's a statement that says, you know, I think Tzedek Umishpat Machon Kiso. It's one of the Kabbalah Shabbat Psalms, which means righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne, of God's throne, meaning God's authority as I believe, God's authority as the divine uh, sovereign of the universe. So just such important thoughts to have as part of who we are as human beings and our relationship to the universe. So let's go into the Rashi here. If there is, let's see. So I'm not seeing that. This is Lamed. So apparently the Rashi does not feel there's a necessity to comment on that, at least in terms of what Rashi is trying to accomplish. And you shall place into the breastplate of judgment et ha'urim ve'et ha'tumim, the urim and the tumim, right? And this, these, this was this um, way of, uh, it was an oracle. That's what we'd call these. So were they stones? Were they referring actually to the um, stones that were on those precious and semi-precious stones that were on the breastplate that we already talked about. But uh, at any rate, Rashi's going to explain what this is. Or were they separate, separate uh, stones that were placed in this pocket that the breastplate 
was made into. Vahayu al, and they shall be on Lev Aaron, on Aaron's heart, Vavo'or Lifnei Hashem, when he comes into before Hashem, Venasa Aaron, again, carrying, right? And Aaron shall bear at Mishpat Bnei Yisrael, the judgment of the children of Israel, Alibo, on his heart. Notice how many times we're talking about Aaron's heart, Lifnei Hashem Tamid, before God, always. Um, does this have to do with a very important principle of accountability, right? And, and that accountability, by the way, also implies uh, that our lives have meaning, right? That they have to be accounted for, that they have, my fun word these days, significance, right? That that's so important for us to understand that our lives have deep significance, each one of us as individuals. And this is one of the ways in which our lives play out in a significant kind of way. All right, so here he's going to talk about it. Ed ha-urim ve-et ha-tumim. So he said, he's going to show that the urim clearly comes from some root like or, which means light. Tum tame uh, is perfect, right? Hu ketav shem. So he says, this is something with the name of God written on it, ketav, right? Shem meforash, the explicit divine name, meaning God's name spelled out completely. Shehaya netano betoch kifle hachoshen which he would place into the fold of the breastplate. She'al yado, by means of which, who may ear dvarav, he illuminates, right, his words, umitamem et dvarav, and clarifies his words. So because this is an oracle, right, the oracle is an instrument by, by means of which you can get messages from God, right? From the you can get divine messages, and so that's what this was about, right? Interesting, interesting thought. And then uh, it's a citation from the Talmud Yoma, a page looks like page seventy-three. Over Mikdasheni, he says, and in the second temple, this is the one that was built after the first exile. Haya Hachoshen, okay. Um, now, okay, the breastplate, and this looks like, okay, there was a breastplate. That's what he said. There was a breastplate. Because it was impossible for a kohen gadol to be, to, to serve with some lack of his uniform, of his clothing. In other words, all these particular items of the Kohen Gadol's, uh, um, his clothing, he had to wear them all when he was ministering in the temple as a Kohen Gadol. Uh, not allowed. So the point, uh, okay, so he says, are we going to go on with the sentence? So Rashi says, yes, there was a Hoshen, there was a breastplate, aval oto Hashem lo haya betucho. However, this name, this explicit name of God was not within this Hoshen. It didn't, didn't do that. So there were certain things that were limitations in the second temple, and this would have been one of the limitations. But al shem oto and by means uh, and by means of this particular uh, script, who karui mishpat. It is also called judgment. Excuse me for a second. Let me find it. Shene'emar, as it states, and he's going to explain a little bit better why it's called Choshen Mishpat, Besha'al lo Mishpat ha'urim. 
So this is a, I believe, I, I'd have to go actually to Numbers 27 if you, if Golda, sometimes you look up references, but it's sounding like, you know, if there was going to be a case that was too difficult to judge, that they could somehow decide. Now, uh, we're going to see. He's going to explain. What am I looking up? I'm sorry. You, you don't have to write the second. I was wondering the context of the cha of chapter 27 in the book of Numbers, but you okay. don't have to look it up right the second. Just let's keep going. Okay, but I, I okay. will have it for after. Okay. Okay. Right. Because it you're going to see, Rashi's going to explain what kinds of judgments at Mishpat B'nai Israel, right? The judgment regarding the children of Israel. And here he goes. Davar shehen nishpaim, okay, benochachim, sorry, nishpatim benochachim, a matter in which they would be judged, benochachim, and admonished, in other words, forewarned, al yado, by means of it, and here we go, im laasot davar or lo laasot. So in other words, when, for ex I'll give you a specific example, whether to wage war against a certain nation. They would consult with the Urim and Tumim to find out if that was something they should do. All right? and uh, But there might be other uh, national, if I can use a, a, an anachronism, okay? But they should, there might be something which the people, as a people, needed a decision as to whether to do it or not to do it, this is where they would consult the Urim and the Tumim. So if you want to check Numbers 27, whether it has to do with a consultation in that context, that would be interesting. Well, do you want me to wait a second, Gold, or you just chime in whenever, or just raise your hand, and I will I will acknowledge you, okay? I don't see... I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute quickly. And I... It starts with Zelophed. Slavfad, yeah. Okay. Slavfad, which are, wherever you put the accent. Okay. 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 And I don't. It's not in that. And then there's uh, then oh. there's a wilderness of Zin. Okay. Let me check. And, okay. Let's finish this up. Let's yeah. Finish up this. That might be wrong. So. And it, it might be. It might be a mistaken connect. Uh, you know, uh, reference. I will check Safari. Okay. Just as soon as we let's get this the sentence done, and then I will take the time to check the barrier. It mishpat ne Israel, right? Ju the judgment regarding the children of Israel. So we did this. Ulefi uh, midrash agada, and according to the midrash, shehachoshen nechaper. Look at this. Remember, I said that every garment of the high priest represents an atonement for a specific kind of sin, right? He says, the choshen mechaper, that the breastplate atones, al me'avte hadin, okay? It atones when justice, justice is perverted. Nikra mishpat, and it is called mishpat, okay? Uh, and it's called the breastplate of judgment, al shem slichat misha mishpat, regarding the atonement for justice, where there might be a miscarriage of justice. So in, what the thought is here is that if there were a miscarriage of justice and they yes. discovered that, they may have to bring offerings and things like that, but there's a certain additional level of atonement that this garment represents. Uh, and I think this is a great place for us to stop for today. Uh, I did find it. Okay. It just, it just, uh, it's in verse 21. Yes. Uh, but he shall present himself to Eliezer, the priest, who shall on his behalf seek the decision of the Urim before the Lord. So it's uh, having to do with the. Uh, Is it a general uh, statement? Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, it's like what will happen if you, uh, you take out, you take the single out Joshua of Nun, an inspired man, and lay your hand upon him, have him stand before Eliezer. Yeah, it's like, it's it's kind of general. Okay, that's, I wanted to know. Yes, and it wasn't specific. Okay, <clears throat> so basically it's saying if it's something that, uh, that um, 
can't be judged through human, you know, through the normal process. That they, right. They have this so the community may not be like sheep and have no shepherd. Okay. Okay. That so comes up ahead of it. It's right. a means of divine communication. I'm going to stop uh, yes. here. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, unless somebody wants to add something at this point, I will stop the recording. I think that uh, if somebody, if they can't judge something, uh, uh, the officers can't judge something, the, the judges can't judge something, and it's real hard to judge that um, uh, uh, that the priests will call on God to judge it. And that's what that woman, that, 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 that those two things are on the, sure. on the, here, you know. <laughs> the cat's helping. <laughs> All right, let me. I can't yeah. pronounce those two things. <laughs> Urim and two. Urim and what? Urim. <laughs> okay. He uh, just called yeah. it Urim. Uh, just made it easier on everybody in the. Okay.